All right, well, this can be more of a fireside chat with, uh, with a number of people here, so uh, feel free to, uh, to ask, ask questions. So what we're talking about is Scientifica PLC, and, and what we do is graphene. Um, the usual disclaimer, which means that uh, you shouldn't believe anything I say or take any action based on anything I say, and I'm sure you've all read that. Uh, we're an AIM-listed company. The uh, ticker is CTFA. Um, the market cap at the moment, I think it's about 850,000. It uh, goes up and down, but hopefully not too much. Um, current directors, uh, my background is I used to be an engineer at the European Space Agency, uh, working on advanced materials, failure analysis, trying to stop things from failing when they were halfway, through, halfway to Mars or Jupiter or wherever we were sending things. And that uh, meant that I was working with materials, you know, trying to uh, understand them down to almost the atomic layer. That, I left in 96, moved into um, a variety of businesses ranging from venture capital through to starting companies. Uh, I spent a lot of time advising people like the World Economic Forum on emerging technologies uh, and also uh, a CEO of, of Scientifica. And the other board members we've got is Tim Baldwin, who's our uh, executive chairman uh, at TXO, non-exec at Scientifica. Uh, he's uh, vastly experienced in the AIM market and corporate finance. And we've also got Rod Venables, who's an ex-nomad, who's uh, also an independent director, just to make sure we keep on the straight and narrow and make comply with all the, uh, the various regulations. Um, there's been a lot of people talking about graphene about the next wonder material and how it's going to change the world and the problem you often get with a lot of these materials is yeah we know that there's something in there but the question is what is it and when is it and how do we get to there and and so really I'll, I'll skip the video because that won't work but there's a lot of talk about things like this. It's very strong, very wonderful material. You can balance an elephant on a pencil on a single sheet of it, if you could, you know, if you could find, find the pencil strong enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's very highly conductive. It's very strong. Companies like Head have just started using it in tennis rackets. Uh, Samsung, LG, and people are all over it for flexible, uh, thin phones. You can. You can make graphene-based inks for things like RF tags. 3D printing, I think, is an area that will be impacted with that because you print something conductive. Another of the applications that people are talking about is terahertz electronics, very high-speed electronics. Once again, you know, that's, that will happen, but not for another 10 or 15 years, so it's not much use to... Uh, to us at the moment. MIT have already got up transistors up to about 500 gigahertz. Uh, but once again, this is very much at a prototype stage, not a production stage. Um, but from my perspective, what we find with graphene is there's absolutely no shortage of scientific funding. There's you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, euros, and dollars going into graphene research all around the world and uh, with my background we know a lot of the people doing the research into graphene and, and understand what they're doing. Um, you can see there's, there's been a big surge in, in, in papers and patents on, uh, on graphene over the last few years, just reflects the amount of academic work that's, that's going into it. But we're not interested in making graphene because there's a lot of companies doing that. We're interested in identifying areas where graphene can be a game changer and then bringing products and devices to market, making use of, of that. Uh, and what I really mean here is building an anti-fragile business model. Now, by anti-fragile, I mean that the only thing we can be certain of with a fast-moving emerging technology is that whatever we decide to do, someone next week will come up with a better, cheaper, faster way of doing it. And you've got to build your business in such a way that you can take advantage of, of that rapid pace of change rather than those, those new events killing your business. And the way we do that is by looking at the applications so we don't have to worry about making graphene. And then we can add in new technologies as they come along. Now, 
there's a lot of different people making graphene. I just spent about a month running around China talking to a lot of them out there. I think applied graphene materials came to market last year. Their business plan talks about producing eight tons a year at 500 pounds a kilo. Um, I can get the same stuff from another UK company and two companies in China at up to about 100 tons a year at about 50 pounds a kilo. So the price has already dropped by 90 percent. So, um, you know, AGM, I think it was a, was a good opportunity for a bit of quick profit. Long term, I'd be a little bit worried about it. So that's why we don't want to get into graphene. And I've seen the same thing happen to a lot of other nanomaterials companies. Even Bayer spent 10 years trying to make carbon nanotubes and graphene and eventually pulled out earlier this year. Uh, so four things that I'm always looking for in, 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 in the businesses I want. We start off with the demand. We're not interested in taking a technology and then running around trying to find a home for the technology. Start off with a demand, somebody who needs stuff. And if you, and if you have that need, it means that we know that there's someone who, if we can provide that solution, they'll pay for it today, not in 10 years' time. Uh, we look for things with channels to market. So, you know, who is that person who's going to make that purchasing decision? What company? Do we have those channels to market? Now, if, if, if it involves the semiconductor industry going, going up against Apple and Samsung, we'll get squashed. You know, we make no bones about it. So it's got to be areas where we know we can, we can get through to sales. There's got to be a high potential for disruption. I'm not really interested in anything that's 10% you know, better or twice as good at twice the price. Ideally, what you're wanting is something that's better and cheaper um, from, a, from a sales perspective. And the last thing we have to worry about is the technology. But as I said, with all the money going into graphene research in the world and the amount of things I get coming across my desk, the technology is the, the last thing we have to worry about. So really, if we identify that need and we say we need a material that does this, that and the other because we can sell it to someone, then I can go out and talk to a number of different sources who can supply me with that technology. And we can do whatever deals need to be done on that. So the kind of things we're looking at is energy storage. Um, people have been talking about supercapacitors for, uh, for electric vehicles, for mobile phones, things like that. Difficult market to get into. Uh, I think what we're looking at for, for, from uh, the kind of deals I'm looking for are things where you can charge something quickly and use it as a storage device and then trickle charge to various sort of electronic devices. And they, the need we're addressing really is all the people you see running around airports trying to find somewhere to plug in a charger. And if we can have a device you can charge in 30 seconds or a minute before you get on a, on a, on a, on a plane, then we know who, where the market is for that and what the channels to the market is, how much people will, will, will pay for that at sort of uh, various shopping malls in, in airports. So it's not as sexy and wonderful as, you know, terahertz electronics or, you know, bendable mobile phones, but it is a market that we know we can get into. Another one is oil water filtration. Graphene is a very good filter medium for a variety of reasons, but mainly because the water molecules can get between the planes of the graphene and, uh, and other things can't. So it's just, you know, the, the spacing of, of those atomic planes. Uh, on tests, it's about 100 times better than reverse osmosis membranes. But the problem with getting into replacing RO water filtration plants, desalination, is that there's a lot of invested capital in there. And if I go along to someone who's just spent 300 million on, a, on an RO plant and tell them we've got a wonderful thing that's made it obsolete, they're going to say, yeah, we'll come back in 10 years' time and talk to us when we've, when we've written down this investment. So the area where we've really identified that is in filtration and oil water separation in the marine industry once again is something where people have already said if you can build a filter not a bit of graphene but if you can build a filter that will allow us to do that then we'll buy it and this is how much we'll buy so uh, so we know where the market is for, for that infrared heating is probably one of the closer to market ones uh, there's been a lot of talk about infrared heating and a lot of people get it completely wrong um, the idea behind infrared, infrared heating is uh, pretty much the same way, the same effect as when the sun comes out from behind a cloud on a winter's day and you instantly feel warm and then cold when it goes behind. So it's instant on, instant off. Um, 
what we're doing there is looking at embedding graphene in a polymer to give it a, the right conductivity, and then we can use that as, as the heat source. Now, the initial tests with the company we're looking at have looked at sort of ceiling tiles for uh, commercial applications, and the, for the same heating effect to heat the same room, we're talking about going down from sort of kilowatts to hundreds of watts. So, we're, you know, we're talking about a, you know, at least a, a tenfold, probably about a thirtyfold increase in efficiency there. And once again, we know enough people in that industry through our, our network that will say, well, if you can deliver that, we will buy it, and we know where we're selling. So. These are the kind of applications we're looking at. Personal wellness, this is another potential opportunity where we're looking at uh, collecting biomedical information. A lot of people have you know, Nike Fuel or Fitbit or Jawbone wristbands that measure the amount of activity you, you take. What it doesn't give you is, a, is what that effect is on your biochemistry. So by using a graphene substrate to immobilize artificial antibodies, and talk to me later if you want the, the technical details of that, um, we can actually, with a, with a pinprick of blood, get biochemical information about things like vitamin levels, hormones like cortisol that are related to stress. And that's the missing piece in your sort of wellness dashboard. So it's not about just you know, the calories you've burnt. And that allows you then to see what the effect of changing your diet is or you know, doing meditation or yoga or any of those kind of things. Huge market for that, and Google, Apple, Samsung are all over this personal health market, and it's, you know, that's, that's what's going to be driving growth in the mobile market for the next uh, five years at, li at least. Uh, we've put together an advisory board that helps us do this. I've got Professor Sir Mark Welland at Cambridge. We set up the Cambridge Nanoscience Centre together uh, about 15 years ago now. Uh, and uh, he used to be chief scientist of the Ministry of Defence, which also brings a whole range of other contacts. The reason I brought uh, Mark on board is he's very sceptical about graphene, and I said that's exactly why I want you on board, because uh, I don't want people who are wildly enthusiastic about things. We've got Case Decker, University of Delft. He's the largest individual recipient of a grant for uh, graphene research, but more importantly, He's one of the best guys in the world at uh, working at the interface between materials and life sciences, which is where we see a lot of future growth. I've got Claire Gray also at, uh, at Cambridge, who sits, up, sits with me on a World Economic Forum committee on uh, energy harvesting. Um, and she is really one of the top people in the world on um, energy storage using advanced materials, and nanomaterials and graphene. Uh, once again, so when something comes across my desk, I say, Claire, what do you think of this? And she's like, uh, you, know, you know what, there's about 10 things that will do that better you know, already. So, so, so it just saves us a lot of time going up blind alleys. And I've got Andrew Maynard, who, uh, who I also work with at the World Economic Forum. And he's a uh, professor of uh, the chair of risk sciences at University of Michigan. And the reason for that is when you're dealing with new materials, you always want to just find out whether there's any potential health issues that you need to address. I mean, I mean it's, not a, it's not a deal killer because we use a lot of horrible chemicals in the semiconductor industry in, in processing. But, it's, it, but if you're just aware of any potential issues before you get too far down the path, then it means you can, you can cover those off and make sure you comply with the, the relative regulation. Um, so I think this sort of high level of research funding that we've got at the moment is generating huge amounts of opportunities. We've got a global network that I'll talk about in a second. We're seeing lots of interesting opportunities. And I think because of certainly our previous experience in nanomaterials, we don't get too excited about graphene. And, and we can take a bit of a sort of a, you know, a rational approach to it rather than uh, a lot of people who just think it's wonderful, we've got to get into it, we've got to get a piece of it, and they quite, tend to be quite uncritical. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got a sort of fairly global network from a lot of the big UK universities that I work with or have worked with over to uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences and Harvard Institute of Technology, uh, all the way over to uh, MIT, where I'm a faculty member on biomedical innovation. Uh, Oh, and, and the University of Michigan. So we've got a wonderful academic network, and that's just the uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we know a lot of other people behind that as well. Um, that gives us, you know, that early access to deals, but also it gives us, you know, when we when we're investing in companies, and they often come to us and say, uh, we need, you know, a million pounds to set up a lab or whatever, and, and I can say, well, 
actually, you know, you should talk to Paul Milner at Leeds, who's already got all of that, and we can just sort of rent a bit of his lab space, you know, certainly in an early stage where, where you don't want to have too much upfront capex, and that just allows you to get a lot further, a lot faster. Uh, I know it's the, it's the instinct of a lot of entrepreneurial scientists who want to have their own lab and their own people, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the lean startup model, having done it several times. So, so I think uh, where we are with graphene is we're, it's a fast-growing market. We're getting it at an early stage and at a quite a rational stage. We're really minimizing the risk both to our investors and to, to myself in terms of wasted time because we're looking at these high added value applications where we know we can address markets and we're not interested in things that are going to be a 10-year R&D program. Uh, we've got these major markets with proven demand and we're, we're really looking at things that we can disrupt. If we're, if we're not going to be disruptive or you know, 10 times better, 10 times cheaper, then it's not really worth uh, getting into it. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've identified a lot of the initial targets and we've initiated the discussions and, uh, and they will be announced in due course as they come to fruition. Thanks. Well, I don't know if we've got time for questions or... Yeah. Well, what we did is we reversed into a shell that used to be known as Avia Health Informatics, and we did that in about uh, October last year. Uh, and we've spent the last uh, three or four months just cleaning all of that out and getting it into a stage where we can operate. And now we've, we've built a platform to be able to take things forward. So, so I don't think they, you know, much, of, uh, much of the share price reflects what was, what was previously done rather than what we are doing and, and are about to do. And there, there is a very good pipeline of, uh, of things. Uh, that will change in the very near future. But I can't. Six months, month, three months. Uh, I, I, well, I'd say in the very near future. I don't. Yeah, you know, time scales are elastic, but we're we're, we're not talking years. Um, I, I, I've been working with Cambridge for years. That's how I, that's how I know Mark Welland and people, and uh, we're involved in the Nanoscience Centre. Um, I didn't go there, but we, we worked very closely with Mark and his centre over the last, what, 15 years since it was set up. Pardon? Uh, yeah, well, we do that on a deal-to-deal -deal basis. I mean, you know, it's, every university has different IP strategies. So even at Oxford, you know, if you come out, do spin out something from the department of chemistry, it has to go through the IP group, it comes out of the Department of Materials, it goes through, uh, you know, they, they can deal with anybody. So, uh, so all of those things you kind of take on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, we're looking, yeah, I mean, we're looking at sort of early stage companies and, and those are the ones that, that benefit from sort of our network and expertise. Because, you know, I've done this many times where, you know, you're pulling a technology out of a university and you have some brilliant scientists, but they often don't know anything about business. Uh, so, so, as I said, so we're starting with really trying to find who needs the technology and then we, then we plug the technology in later. So start off with that need.